Well, good morning. <laughs> she did fantastic, right? I mean, now you all know some things about defrost and all that. So, Well, I want to thank you all for choosing to worship with us this morning. Uh, it's, it's a blessing to have you here. There's a couple things I want to draw your attention to real quick. In your bulletin, you should find this in your pew on the ends. A couple of them are in the middle. Uh, and that'll be your source of information for the rest of the week. Instead of going through everything, because there's a lot of stuff in here, I just want to point out a couple quick things. Today, uh, later this evening, we have our chili cook-off. Yeah, Steve's ready. I tell you, we got a couple serious chilliers around here. Al, Al's looking at me over his glasses. He's ready to go. It's going to be fun. I want to invite you guys to come out again, 5 o'clock. It's a chili cook-off, but honestly, it's just fellowship. And we're going to have fun hanging out, eating chili, voting. Um, and if you do win, there is a prize. Remember that. It's homemade prize, though. So, I mean, it's cool, but... Yeah, 5 o'clock. Hope you can come out. Um, Saturday, we will be having our church work day. All right, we made the shift to a church work day a couple months ago and, and how we called it that. Um, it's really an opportunity for the church family to come together and take care of some of the things that need to be taken care of here at the church. Everybody could do something. So if you're concerned, oh, I can't do anything, yes, you can. Come on out. If even just to keep us fellowshipping and conversating and just getting to know each other better, uh, that'll be Saturday starting at 8.30. And usually a couple hours and we're out of here. So I want to invite you to be part of that. If you're doing Kids Hope, we have some training coming up. You should be aware of that. That'll be Thursday at 9 a.m. And then we have the 200th Anniversary Committee is, is requesting some assistance. They've been asking for assistance for a while now, and they're getting a little more specific with what they're looking for. So if you take some time, please read through the bulletin, that section about reflections, recipes, and photographs, and find out how you can contribute to the celebration that will be coming up here in a few short months. Trees and Treasures, we have a finalized time and date for that now. Uh, the city voted to have the treats or the trick-or-treating on Sunday, which is the 31st. So we will be doing the same thing. It'll be held on the 31st. We will be going from 5 to 7, and the city will be going until 8. So there will be some overlap. We'll cut out early if you got kids that want to go out or whatever. Um, so if you have signed up, thank you. You've got the finalized time there. If you haven't signed up to help, please consider. Carrie's got ideas. If you don't have an idea for boots or things, um, one thing that everybody can help with, which we always do a great job, candy. You see bins out there, we need candy. We try to, as a church, provide the candy, to dish out to the different stations so that when the kids come, we can make sure they get plenty of candy. And just one of those... Uh, Things where they leave First Baptist grounds with a sweet taste in their mouth. So don't get junky candy because that just represents as bad. Get good candy. All right. There's one last thing I want to point out. Actually, there's two things. The first, the ladies have started conversating about this new ministry opportunity uh, calling Create to Connect. They've come up with a project that will be the first one. You see the information out there. This is vital to the health of the church. Okay? We know the nuts and bolts, Scripture, learning the, the Word of God, walking in His ways. Part of those ways are fellowship and discipleship, growing together. We've had things in the past for a long time. We had some lulls in some areas. But you're going to see a re revitalization of these efforts to get us back together just to spend time and get to know each other. So this is the first way that's happening. Create to connect. I'd like to invite the ladies of the church to consider doing that. The information is there. You can talk to one of the three listed there, Julie, Bree, or Carrie. If you don't know who they are, would you please stand up? Two weeks in a row. These are the ladies who have the answers. Yeah, Al, we can clap. And you thought the frost conversation was awkward. 
Yes. Uh, so again, plenty of information through the bulletin. Please take a look at it. Don't toss it out until you, you've got things down. We've got prayer requests on there. Uh, many of these prayer requests also are praise reports for progress. So please continue to use this throughout the week and consider how you can join with your church family. Uh, one, now this is the last thing I think. I always add one last thing, but we'll try not to. We have a local celebrity in church this morning. Daryl Thomas. Yes. <laughs> so so Daryl, and he, he downplays it because that's just how he is. But Daryl was inducted into the National 4-H Hall of Fame. Um, and I know you all know what this is, but because it's what I do, I'm going to tell you, National is big time. That's not just Putnam County Hall of Fame. That's not just Greencastle Hall of Fame. National level. They recognized his efforts, devotion, commitment. And I want to say I'm so happy to have you part of this family, Daryl. So thank you. All right. Well, this morning as we get into worship, let's pray together. Almighty Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity you've given us to freely assemble with fellow believers, Lord, in our church family. We thank you that you've trusted us with your word, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us to learn and grow together. And we pray, Lord God, that your presence would be here this morning. That you prepare our hearts to worship you. That you be preparing us to receive uh, your blessing and knowledge as you pour it out. We thank you, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, would you stand and worship with us as we sing, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus into my heart I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart Possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure Since Jesus came into my heart And no dark clouds of doubt Now my pathway obscure Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy on my soul Like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart There's a light in the valley of death now for me Since Jesus came into my heart And the gates of the city beyond I can see Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart. I'm happy, so happy as onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart Would you pray with me? Father God, we just come to you this morning, and we lift up our hearts to you. We are so thankful that you're living 
inside of our heart, and we just, we just devote this time to you. We just sing and we raise our voices as an aroma of praise to you this morning. It's in your name that we pray. The king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good. I searched the world, but you couldn't fill me. Man, empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Sing it out. You came along and put me back together. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, 
failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn the morning to Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. appreciate Pastor Tom because he's always been consistent with making sure our youth is getting supported and coming to church and just feeling like they are part of the church. So I was pretending to be superhero pastor! Like Tom's uh, enthusiasm and the, along with the uh, sincerity that he uh, tries to get the congregation to pass on the word. When I was uh, in the hospital and nursing home last spring, Pastor Tom took the time to call me more than once and because of his concern for me, that led me to start attending the church again and actually become a full-fledged member and I really appreciate Tom. Pastor Tom inspires me to be a better Christian with his upbeat insights into God's Word and provides me energetic direction on how to be a better servant for Jesus. Tom, we appreciate you for your forward thinking and for your vision for our church, and we are excited to see what the coming year brings. Hey, everybody. Pastor Tom here from First Baptist Church. I want to remind you and invite you to our service on Sunday. Pastor Tom. At Roman Park. You have meant day. so much to our family. We're going to be out here Sunday morning. It's and we appreciate beautiful. you so much. Be nice. I've never seen a pastor Normal whose heart is just so full of wanting sunshine. to save those who are lost. You are just full of the Holy Spirit and just wanting um, to help this church move forward. God bless. And you have a heart that's a servant for the Lord. Yeah, there you go. We're live. 
Hey, everybody. We're here at First Baptist Church. We've got the community pool open. We're here till 8 o'clock tonight. It's free. Come on out. Hang out with us. Have a great time. we got snacks, popsicles, water, yeah. fun, water slides, carry. Yep. Come join us. <laughs> right? Right. Come okay. on out. I appreciate that Tom's message always has application to it, and it's not just a teaching experience. Continue to pray that uh, you are filled with the Holy Spirit and to help save the lost that come into our church. We appreciate you so much. Our God loves us. He's good. He's not going to send you into a battle where you're not prepared or equipped to survive. Pastor Tom. This armor is real. It's not just a children's lesson. This armor is real because spiritual warfare is real. I'm asking you to pray for the people. If you can't physically do it, you can intercede and pray. That is warfare. Don't stand by idle. Strap up your armor and get in the fight. Grab your shield and get next to the person and make your shield of faith bigger. Be ready for the war. Strap up. Put your gear on. And let's do what we're called to do. Pastor Tom. Now they're ready for them. If the leadership team will join me up front. We're Appreciate going to it, Pastor. Hands on. So anybody that would like to come forward, feel comfortable coming forward and join us. You know, I, there's nothing we can say that exemplified what we just saw better than what was just said. Tom has comforted us, healed us, and helped us. He walked along beside us. Uh, and because of that, we rejoice in this opportunity of fellowship and been able to uh, enjoy pastor appreciation because we truly, earnestly do appreciate. Uh, so many times we don't say it but we feel it in our hearts. So we thank you for that. If we shall. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you today, Lord. We just praise you for bringing Tom and his family to us, the sacrifices that they've made for us. We do, uh, are extremely thankful, Lord, for the blessing that he has been and his leadership his compassion, his love for the sacrifices that his family is making for us, Lord. We just thank you for that. We just thank you, Lord, for the symbol that he is for us in you and the message that you bring through him. We just ask you, Lord, to bless him and his family in an extremely special way, Lord, that he feels our appreciation and our love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Well, this is uh, the point in our service where we invite our children uh, to head back to our FBC Kids Church. You'll see some of our adult leaders with their First Baptist shirts on. If you want to send the kids with them, they'll head back for the children's lesson and snacks and games and get a Bible lesson. 
Uh, I want to touch on that real quick here. <clears throat> First thing is, do not be jealous of my superhero costume. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I love you guys. Uh, I truly try to articulate how much I appreciate all of you. To me, a pastor is not just a title you have. It's, a, it's, it's what you do with the people you're entrusted with. And I truly care about all of you. When I, when I try to do something, it's because I truly care about you. So to see, oh man. <clears throat> To see that it's recognized, that you guys see that I care is important to me. Because I've shared many times, and Dee Dee hates this term, so I'm going to say it one last time. I used to be emotionally constipated. The Marine Corps spent eight years of my life helping me break the connection to my emotions so I could be more effective in what I had to do. And it was a prayer of mine for years that I would get fixed that God would make my heart soft again, that I could experience emotions besides anger and frustration. And he has and continues to do that, and he's using all of you, and I am so thankful for each one of you. Thank you very much for that encouragement. Uh, I wish I could explain better, but thank you very much. You are all an incredible blessing to me and my family, and we are so happy to be here, so thank you. All right. Well, this morning, we're picking up where we left off last week. We looked at the call of Saul. Murderous threats. That's one of the last things we talked about last week. We talked about how nasty Saul was and how completely counter to the scripture he really was. How completely counter to Jesus Christ Saul lived. And he didn't live so in hiding. He was out front leading the charge to imprison those who followed Jesus. He didn't care if you were a man or a woman. He just wanted you gone. But then we see that through the direct intervention of Jesus Christ, things became different. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for today, Lord. And, and personally, I thank you so much for entrusting me with the people of First Baptist, Lord. Lord, you knew my heart and my prayers long before I gave them. But I thank you. I thank you that we can freely come together without any fear of repercussion, that we can lift up our voices in praise and know that you are smiling upon us. Lord, I thank you that you've entrusted us with your word. We thank you for Jesus and the salvation that he offers. Lord, I thank you for each person who's here this morning, either in person or online, Lord God. I thank you for their hearts to get to know you better and walk more faithfully with you. I pray now, Lord God, that you would speak through me, that despite my challenges, despite whatever shortcomings I present, that you would speak through and that your message would be received loud and clearly into each one of our hearts. We pray, Lord God, that you would be glorified, not only this morning through the message and praise, but through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we pick up this story, like I said, we left off last week. Saul, who later becomes Paul. So Saul is in Damascus. He was guided there by his travel companions. He was blinded from his encounter with Jesus and has been without food and drink for three days. Now, we, we talked last week how there are some who think he was in shock, and that's why he wasn't eating or drinking. There's many more who believe he was fasting. 
He just had an experience with Jesus Christ, the one who he intentionally persecutes, and just was called on that directly. So I tend to believe that it was fasting. There may be an element of shock there. But the fact he knew so clearly the laws before and how God was to be worshipped and now just encountered Jesus, I believe that he was submitting himself through that way. So now that we know where Saul is at, let's pick up today in Acts 9, 10 through 19. As always, if you have your Bible, I'll give you a couple seconds to get there. If you don't have your Bible, the words will be up on the screen. There we go. I got a clicker. That was cool though, wasn't it? Yeah. Let us receive the word of our Lord. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell off Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Thank you, Lord, for your word. There is so much in that that we could study it for a couple weeks at a time. Let's just jump right into this, this week's lesson, this, this week's points. Number one, Saul's call involved other believers. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we don't acknowledge that truth. Between the, the, the message last week and this week, we see that when God calls somebody, he places other people in their lives to help that call. In this case, we see right away, Saul's riding into town, experiences Jesus' encounter, goes blind, goes aground, can't see. If he was alone, what happens to Saul there? Well, we don't really know, but let's, let's pretend we could figure this out. Here's a guy who's been persecuting and who's looked at as being this mean person. Now he's going to be blind, out on this main road, walking between cities. The likelihood of good things happening are probably, probably pretty slim. But God gave him his guides and companions to help him, even when he couldn't see, to help get him where God wanted him. Now, I use the example here. When God calls a pastor, he doesn't just say, hey, go be a pastor. Here's a church of 500 people. Go and do it. No. God says, hey, and my, I'll use me as an example. I'm calling you to the ministry to be a pastor. But before you get there, go through all these life experiences with all these people. Before I entrust you with them, I want you to have some formal education. You go and do that too. Before I entrust you with them, I want you to learn from mentors that have cared for my people in this way. 
Now that you're a pastor, have these people walk alongside you. Nowhere in my call to ministry did God say, you're alone in this, figure it out. Never. And we see with Saul the same thing. God spoke directly to him. And his companions were aware of what was going on, but couldn't see nobody. So they saw, okay, something's happening here. I'm going to help Saul do what needs to be done. How many of you have ever heard a believer, or even someone who's not really a believer, say something along the lines of, my relationship with God is between him and I. Just me and him. I've heard that many times from people when I say, hey, if you consider small groups growing in relationship with other believers, I don't need that. Then they just get in my business and gossip. My relationship with God is between me and him. And I've gotten better at this response, but it used to be, you're wrong. Now it's more gentle and it's basically you're wrong. And I go on to explain exactly what we just talked about. Now, other people do not dictate your salvation. That is a you and God thing through Jesus Christ. We all affirm and understand that, right? That we don't get saved because we hang out with Christians. That our life does not become holy and righteous because we only hang out with church people. All that is from God through the Holy Spirit, our pursuit. But what it does mean is that it's much easier to grow in your faith, to become mature in your spirituality when you surround yourself with other believers. God gives you them, them to help that process. Let me ask you, this is kind of a silly question, but I'm hopefully it'll come through okay. Would I still be a pastor if I didn't have a church family to pastor? There's, I mean, there's not really right or wrong. I mean, I would still call myself a pastor because I'm still called to be a pastor. But pastoring is something we do. Someone can wear the title of pastor and not pastor people, not care about people at all. Okay, they could be a teacher. But even then, so are teachers teachers if they're not teaching? Well, a one standard, yeah. It doesn't change who they are. But then you're identified as being what you are by what you used to do. Oh, Carrie used to be a teacher over there. Oh, well, Carrie's still a teacher, it just used to occur over there. Right? So I'm still a pastor, it just used to occur over there. But when we got people, it becomes what we're doing. I've got people that I care for and pastor, therefore I'm pastor. Saul was a, a persecutor and he was surrounded by other persecutors and they knew him as such. Now, Saul, interjected by Jesus, God used people to bring him into a different crowd. He was hunting the way, but God used people to bring him into the way. And that leads us to the next point. Despite being truly counter to Christ, once meeting Jesus, Saul became part of the family. That goes back to point number one. If I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I say, I'm still going to hang out with this biker gang who gets their jollies from beating up people and stealing candy from children, it's going to be very difficult for me to live a righteous life and glorify God through my life, right? Would we agree or no? I see a couple heads shake. I've shared this before and I'll share it now. 
it may be inaccurate, I can't remember. My dad told me something along the lines of, if you take a bad piece of fruit or a bad piece of fruit, food and you stick it amongst a good piece of fruit, does the good fruit turn the bad fruit good again? Or does the bad fruit accelerate the deterioration of the good fruit? In case you're confused, the bad fruit wins. Right? The good fruit does not turn the bad fruit good again. That was something for me that was so difficult in my own faith walk. I've shared before, I was raised in the church, I was heavily involved, and then in my upper teen, middle teen years, I went away and then got in the Marine Corps and I went as far away as I could from walking in a way that glorified God. And part of that was I bought into that saying, so instead of resisting the decay, I fully embraced it. That I'm not gonna surround myself with these believers because that makes me feel crummy when I mess up. If I surround myself with these delinquents, then even if I only mess up a little bit, I still look okay. So even though I did it wrong, I still recognized the concept of needing people. God gives us people to become the body of Christ. As Ananias went and met Saul in this place, how did he greet him? Remember? Brother Saul. Now, do you remember what occurred shortly before that when he was talking to God and said, Whoa, you want me to go and talk to this guy? He was sent here for the sole purpose of arresting us and throwing us in prison because we follow you. You're sending me to him? And God said, yep, go. Well, then we read on that and nice went. And he gets there, and we know the trepidation and concern that he had a little bit ago. But God said, go. And he went. And simply because God said he's one of mine, he became one of his. God told him, this is my child. I don't care what he's done over here. You don't worry about that. He's mine. Go to him and help him follow me. I got big plans for that guy. And he did, and he went, and, and brother Saul. Now, there's some people, some commentaries, some theologians that think that this was just a greeting because they were both Jewish. My response to that is, Pfft. if we reduce what God says and how this plays out to a simple greeting, it would have been just like any other greeting in Scripture. There wouldn't have been a definition here. There wouldn't have been a defined response. It would have just said, Saul, I'm here. No, no, no. God saw fit to put in there, brother thereby indicating that simply once he received the in injection of Jesus Christ, that God already acknowledged that he was to be used by him, he becomes part of the family. And Ananias brought him in. Folks, that's how we're supposed to be. That's how we're supposed to be. I've said this before. If you would have met me in my early 20s, you probably would have locked the door. You probably would have said, this guy looks like he's bad news. You know, like, that's why I'm glad we let Scott in, because he's kind of the same. <laughs> that's who we need to be. We need to say, God, you brought this person into the doors? Welcome, brother. Now, obviously, us welcoming them as brothers or sisters does not mean they're saved. But what it means is we're open to the fact God brought you here to receive his truth. And in faith, we are praying that you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, where you can truly be our brother and sister in Christ. Because that's step one. Why would I want to belong to a family that rejects me before I'm even here? If Saul comes out and he says, and Ananias goes, 
hey, you persecutor, I guess I got to pray for you. Is that received differently than if, hey, Brother Saul, I, I was told you were expecting me, let's pray. Right? You are a representative of the God you serve. The people you interact with, the people who walk through these doors, the people you meet at Walmart, there will be a time where you will be associated to the God you serve. And they'll say, man, I met them at Walmart and they were super awesome. I didn't know you went to church here. That makes sense. Or, man, I saw them at Walmart. They were crashing into my ankles with their car telling me to move. They were really a jerk. They go to church here? You see that? How Ananias responded reflects God in his relationship with him. Reflect on your own relationship right now and how you interact with the people around you. God's going to keep putting them there. We saw that point one. God uses people. Body is many parts. You can't have a body that's just a giant thumb. People are always going to be there. And how you interact with them determines, at least initially, how they see Jesus. I kind of beat this point, but I'm going to touch on it one more time. This is a place, this building, this sanctuary, it's just a room. It is. It's just a room. This building is just a building. But what we do when we get here is worship God, what makes this place a holy place. How many times in Scripture do we hear God say, hey, take your shoes off where you're on his holy ground? What? I'm out here by a bush. I'm not in a temple. I'm not... God is present in his holy ground. Right? So if we're here in a place that's supposed to be holy and even viewed by the world as a safe place, sanctuary, and we've got people who come in and we think in our mind, Boy, I hope they don't come back next Sunday. Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Nope. Now listen, do not raise your hand. Again, not. How many of you have thought like that before? I'll raise mine. And I'm a pastor. I've had people where I'm like, Lord... And this is how I twist it. Get this. Lord, I think they're a better fit for a different church. Please take them there. And then I usually get smacked. And God says, you know how many pastors probably said that about you, bonehead? You go where I, give, where I send you. They go where I send them. You receive and you love them. And I am so glad that God has brought me through that. Because when I was younger and I had just returned to my commitment to Christ and I was walking through different leadership things, I used to think that way. I had an acquaintance who was addicted to drugs. And he would come to church and he, we'd sent him, as a church, we had sent him to rehab two or three different times for months at a time. And every time he would come back and be good for a month or two, and then he would leave his family again to go and get high and then not come home for weeks. And so our church family, the men would step up and mow the lawn and help the, the wife take care of the kids. And every time he'd come back and he'd come up to me, it took, every, I'm getting goosebumps right now. It took every ounce of energy I had not to lay into this guy in absolute anger. Like, why are you here? You're making a mockery of God's grace. Which Ananias, or Ananias could have done, but he didn't. And God brought me through this with this individual to a place where I said, I'm going to pray for you as much as I possibly can. You call me when you need me. But until you can take this serious, don't pretend to take it serious. Because you are destroying your family. So I was able to give him truth while still loving the way Christ did. And Ananias did exactly the same thing here. He didn't pretend that he wasn't nervous or that Saul did no wrong, but he welcomed him into the family because God said, he's going to be part of my family. 
Ananias went over his own understanding and was obedient. And let's see what happens with that obedience. Number three, the Holy Spirit provides the clear sight for moving scales from our spiritual lives. So we read about this here. It happened in a physical manner, right? Prayed for him, immediately something fell off his eyes. In the Moody Bible commentary, there's a parallel here between Saul's physical blindness and spiritual blindness. He knew all the traditional ways. He knew all the laws. He knew the way God should be worshipped based on the laws. As we talked about last week, because he held on to those traditions in ways it used to be, he missed the way Jesus Christ was working in the present. Well, Jesus interjected in, made him physically blind, but spiritually able to see. It took Jesus being present, connecting with him. Then it took the prayers of another believer for those scales to come off. Did you catch it as we read the passage? That they didn't just fall off. God sent another believer to interject into his life to support him, to care for him, to pray for him. And upon praying for him, something like scales fell from his eyes. Once he did, he could see. What did he do once he could see? He was baptized. This man who hunted down Christians stood by where one was murdered with stones a short time ago, relied on a Christian to lay his hands upon him and pray, and he was able to see again, physically and spiritually. That spiritual truth became clear now, and you could see, he said, ah, I've dedicated my life to the wrong things. God, I want to worship you, Lord Jesus. And the Holy Spirit fell upon him. And he was baptized. We remember that baptism is a bold statement of faith in Jesus Christ, right? Proclaiming your relationship with him. Look where Saul was to where Saul is. And how God made that happen. His call was not just on Saul alone. I've told people for pastors, you don't just call the pastor, the family gets to call. When you call a pastor and his family, the entire church is called to support that pastor and family in doing the mission of Christ. Your call involves other people. Those other people will help you get to where you need to be in obedience to God. If you isolate yourself from them, you will struggle more than you need to. That's just truth. That's just truth. Whether it's intentional or not, it's harder. There's a reason we pray so hard for shut-ins and the reason that this COVID was so bad in the beginning when we couldn't see anybody. It cut us off from relationships that help encourage us in our faith. You all come to church Sunday morning and you got friends here. How many of you hang out with each other outside of church? A couple of us do. Friends, we need more than Sunday morning. We need family. We need spiritual family time. There's a reason it was organized in the past where you'd have Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, And then you do other things with your church family. Because we need those believers around us more than once a week. We need relationships that encourage us to be who we're supposed to be. To fulfill whatever call is on our life.
God used a couple people to get Saul where he needed him. God used one man to pray for Saul to remove the scales from his eyes and receive the Holy Spirit, and his life was never the same. We forget that as Christians. Too many times we neglect to understand how powerful that is. Maybe some of you have had moments like that where instead of Ananias, he's saying, hey, you, go pray for this person. Hey, you, let's go greet them with a friendly handshake. And your response is, Lord, (laughs) you don't know that guy like I do. He's bald and got tattoos. He's no good. I pray right now that if you've had those moments, that you would recognize them and learn from them. That you would seek to be like Ananias. And it's okay to be scared, to to be concerned. Walk in obedience anyway. Because you have no idea if God's using you to prepare the next Saul. You have no idea if the person that he sends you to pray for is going to be next Billy Graham. Just waiting for somebody to lay their hands upon him so that their spiritual scales can be removed and they can see clearly and dedicate themselves to the call. God uses people to help his people. As we get ready to wrap this up, I'm going to summarize a couple quick things. And I've talked about them all. So they're, no, they're not new. There's no slides. It's just a quick summary. We must constantly seek to be a united body in Christ. Working for unity and loving each other as family. If we're only together on Sundays and then we spread out and try to come back together on Sundays and then spread out, there's a constant flux, right? Eventually what happens is it starts to get so relaxed and loose that the tension doesn't bring us back anymore and we, and we lose people. We need to care about each other daily. And I'm not saying we all got to hang out every single day. But be intentional about trying to connect beyond these walls with your church family. In our walk, we need to be aware of opportunities that we could be Ananias to people, ready to pray at a moment's notice, ready to walk alongside and assist. Our call does not isolate us from the world. It calls us into it to be God's hands and feet. And lastly, we must work diligently to ensure that we do not allow our spiritual vision to become blinded, blurred, or blocked by the ways of the world. Those ways could include the way we do church. Those ways could include uh, the way we interact with culture. Those ways could include uh, hurt that has been from the past. It doesn't matter what causes the blurriness or blindness. What matters is we seek to get it removed as soon as possible. And when we're amongst other believers, that happens more quickly. Because now we remember, hey man, what you're saying doesn't sound right. And we can, we can hold each other accountable and support each other. Like, let's pray about that. That doesn't seem correct. And ultimately, the spiritual clarity comes from constantly seeking guidance of the Holy Spirit and surrendering to the will of God. We see that throughout this entire story. We see this with Saul. We see it with his guides. We see it with Ananias. All that one man may begin his call correctly and bring the gospel to a world of unbelievers. Let us all seek to be just like them. Walk in obedience. Walk in submission. And seek to love like Jesus Christ. 
That starts with salvation. I know I've said this many times, and I'm going to say it many more times. This church is built upon seasoned believers. You've accepted Christ many years ago, and you've been walking faithfully ever since. But there's some of you who accepted Christ many years ago who've kind of gotten complacent. Maybe it's now time to say, I've got to recommit. I've got to say, okay, God, get me back on it. Let's do this. Maybe you've never had that relationship with Jesus Christ. That you can. It really is a simple thing to pray. There's no fancy words. There's not a, a, a lecture or a script you need to know. You simply acknowledge your need to be saved. You simply acknowledge, Lord, I've been living counter to your will. And when you live like that, we call it sin. Sin separates you from God, your ability to have relationship with him. He sent Jesus Christ that you may have relationship with him, that that bridge may be closed. And you could be fully in relationship with a loving God. You acknowledge that and you say, God, I want that. Forgive me and help me not to do it. I want Jesus to be my Savior. And you believe that Jesus, the Son of God, will save you from the consequences of sin. That again, you may have that relationship with the creator of all. Of course, you can do that prayer wherever you sit. Or you can come forward and we can pray together. This place is a place of prayer. This church will be a house of prayer, like scripture says. You can come forward and we can pray here. We can come forward, we can pray on these pews. You can sit where you are and we can pray. It doesn't matter where you are, your heart will scream out and God will hear you. And if you know him as your savior and you find yourself complacent and comfortable, I encourage your prayer right now would be, Lord, fire me up. Help me. My spiritual vision is getting a little blurry. I'm starting not to see how amazing you are. Help me see clearly, Lord, that I may do what you've called me to do and help others in their call as well. As we close in prayer for this message, you guys know by now that I'd like to pick something we pray for together as a body in this limited time we have together. And today, we're going back to, unfortunately, old reliable Haiti. So we've been praying for Haiti and just the absolute torment that's been going on. I just read a story this morning. 17 missionaries were kidnapped. Just, just because they want money. That place is so dark right now. I've got a friend who's a, a Haitian missionary here in the States right now. And we're talking about getting him here. And we talked last week and he just... He just laid it out how dark it is there right now. And for those of you who don't know, Haiti's been dark for a long time. But right now, it's real bad. They are in need of Jesus Christ. Provisions in the physical. Healing and protection in the spiritual. And many of them don't know Christ. So it takes believers all over this world to lift them up. To call down the power of God upon that country and people. So when we pray, that's my prayer. That we're going to interject like Ananias did for Saul. And we're going to pray for Haiti and the people in Haiti. That Jesus Christ may speak to those that do not know him. That the Lord God Almighty would pour his blessings out and healing upon that country. With that said, let's pray together. Lord God, we do. We come before you so grateful and thankful that you've blessed us in such an incredible way that many times people in this country forget how blessed we are. So we thank you for that, Lord God, and we thank you for the truth of your word to help us see that this knowledge is nothing without practical application. We can know what the word says, but if we don't do it, we're worse. So we pray right now, Lord God, like Ananias did for Saul, we pray right now that the power of Jesus Christ would interject into the country of Haiti right now, Lord God. And we pray that as broadly as possible, 
We pray that you would interject for spiritual salvation, that the truth of the gospel may be known. But we also pray, Lord God, that you would meet the physical needs. You tell us that you'll take care of us. You tell us how aren't we more important than sparrows? And Lord God, in that country and many others, there's, there's children that sleep in the streets that have to eat out of trash cans that are kidnapping other people just to get money. We pray, Lord God, that you would meet the needs of that people and in doing so that you would draw them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that you would free them from the darkness that is over that country, Lord. And again, Lord God, just like Ananias prayed for Saul, we pray right now that your spirit would be present and obvious in the healing of that country. We thank you for the truth of your word, Lord, and we thank you for Jesus Christ. It's in his mighty name we pray. Amen. The road is up, we must keep climbing, looking onward to Jesus, who is Lord, and he reigns forever. We're going to sing that again. The road is up, we must keep climbing, looking onward to Jesus, who is Lord. shall reign. 
Jesus shall reign over all the earth. Jesus shall reign over all. He is Lord. He is the Lord, I declare his word. Jesus is Lord over all. Sing it again. Jesus shall reign over all the earth. Jesus shall reign over all. He is Lord Almighty. He is the Lord, I declare his word. Jesus is Lord over all. The road is up. The road is up. We must keep climbing, looking onward to Jesus, who is Lord, and he reigns forever. The road is up. We must keep climbing, looking onward to Jesus, who is Lord, and he reigns. He is Lord. Amen. And he reigns forever. Thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning. You are all a blessing to me and so many that you will never even know about until heaven. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for each person here today. I thank you for reigning your presence upon us. We pray now, Lord God, that you would have filled us full and send us out into this world that we may love and care for these people. Use us, Lord, for your glory, for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Thank you for trusting us with that. We love you, Lord, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.